So I guess we should do Styracosaurus, considering how many toys of this, uh, this animal I have. Uh, thank you to everyone who has sent them in. I have to focus on a particular one, however. So I am choosing to focus on this purple Styracosaurus that a person named Joanna Wojcicka in Poland sent in. Um, she has helpfully provided me with a phonetic pronunciation of her last name but the letter C in Polish I have learned is not to be trusted, so I hope I'm saying her name right, but thank you, Joanna. I rather like this Styracosaurus because when put into context with all of these other toys, we have almost a parade through the century to, to look at how our ideas about this animal have, have evolved you know, roughly, because different things filter down to toy sculpts at different times, but um, Styracosaurus being known for as long as it has and being as popular as it is, uh, has had quite a variety of tropes accumulate over the years. Um, so we will get to see how we have gotten from a, a sort of frilled lizard hippo to a rhino gazelle bird. And we're not just considering the anatomy, though that has had some revisions over the century. We're also considering the ecology uh, and the behavior. We're, we're considering the environment in which the animal lived, what other animals it was alongside. We're considering uh, its phylogeny. There's been some interesting developments regarding animals that we thought were Styracosaurus might actually be a separate genus. Um, Really, just generally, we're, we're trying to move away from a hippo-like animal and towards maybe a pig animal. Which fits, because if it's living alongside the hadrosaurs, which are the cows of the Cretaceous, this guy would be the pigs of the Cretaceous. This guy, in that case, meaning like ceratopsids generally, or maybe chentrosaurines specifically. Styracosaurus albertensis as the name implies, is from Alberta, Canada, specifically Dinosaur Provincial Park, uh, the Dinosaur Park Formation. Uh, to the surprise of no one, it was described by Lawrence Lamb uh, in 1913. That was based on a partial skull, but a full skeleton, well, nearly complete skeleton, uh, was dug up by Brown and Schleicher uh, a few years later. However, it was not described until 1937. Um, the picture that we get from that skeleton is a picture of an animal rather similar to Centrosaurus. Interesting aside, or infuriating aside, if you are a dinosaur specialist, there was a little squirrel-sized marsupial otter lodged underneath that Styracosaurus hip bone. Uh, that got described in, I think, 1916, like a year after the skeleton was dug up. But then it took another 20 years to, to get to describing the actual, you know, big, impressive, giant dinosaur. Not bitter. There have been a number of other Styracosaurus species named over the years. Some of them uh, have been sunk into Albertensis. Some have been found to be not Styracosaurus at all. They just had periodal spikes, and for a while we were just saying, oh, it has periodal spikes. Probably Styracosaurus. Parietal spikes. You will all know what parietal spikes are by the end of this video, <laughs> I promise. Um, uh, some of them were sunk into the only other species we're interested in today, Ceracosaurus ovatus, which is from Montana, the Two Medicine Formation, which is blocked by dinosaurs, so I'm not even going to try and point at it. Um, <laughs> ovatus was for a long time, a frill fragment found by Sternberg in 1928, described by Gilmore in 1930. Uh, the main difference from Styracosaurus was and still pretty much is the arrangement of the parietal spikes. 
Some researchers found that Ovatus is actually a separate genus from Styracosaurus. It's now called Rubeosaurus ovatus. The interesting thing about splitting up this genus is that it lets us talk about the frankly crazy diversity of ceratopsids in the continent of Laramidia in the late Cretaceous. This was a late Cretaceous animal. It was 75 million years ago, the end of the Campanian. So this was in the same formation as Parasaurolophus and Euovlocephalus that we talked about earlier. Uh, it was not a contemporary of either of them. Well, it might have been, it, it has a little bit of overlap with Euoplocephalus, but I'm not sure if we've ever specifically found Euoplocephalus and Styracosaurus like in the same rocks uh, or at the same site. At that time, the continent that we call North America was split by the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. And in the east, we have Appalachia, which we don't know a whole lot about. Uh, and in the west, we have Laramidia, which is somewhere between the size of India and the size of Australia. And it is chock full of weird dinosaurs. Like, this is one of the only places that we find uh, uh, the advanced ceratopsids. The ceratopsids we find elsewhere in the world, with one notable exception from China, are not this big and not this weirdly adorned. <laughs> As I mentioned in the Triceratops episode, we usually divide the ceratopsids into chasmosaurines, like Triceratops, and centrosaurines, like Centrosaurus or like Styracosaurus. Within the centrosaurines, we have now three what are called tribes. We have the Centrosaurini, the Pachyrhinosaurini, and the Nesutoceratopsini. Um, where within those tribes Styracosaurus fits in, has had some variations. Usually it was recovered as the, the closest relative to Centrosaurus itself. But if I had to characterize the various revisions over the years, it's generally been moving more basally. And now that we have Rubeosaurus as a separate genus, sometimes uh, Rubeosaurus and Styracosaurus are not even recovered as sister taxa. They're not even considered the closest relatives to one another. Sometimes Rubeosaurus uh, is closer to or even within the uh, Pachyrhinosaurini. As of this episode, however, Styracosaurus and Rubeosaurus are the closest relatives to one, one another, and they are within the Centrosaurini. These earlier toys that we have are representing a pretty consistent picture of, of what we thought about ceratopsids in general and Styracosaurus specifically in the early part of the 20th century, even though most of these are from the 70s. Um, We've got this very smooth sort of bell curve with a tail dragging on the ground, or nearly so. Long serpentine looking tail, no neck at all, and, and just this ring of frill spikes with, with very little specificity or variation between them. And a short little blunt nose spike. Um, just overall a much more lizard-like creature than, than what we're, we're dealing with nowadays with animals like what this Joanna's toy, I don't know the make of this one, with what Joanna's toy are depicting or what this Papo toy is depicting. Um, I will say that the neck on the Papo toy maybe is taking things a bit far. Um, it is of appropriate length, but I, I don't know how like how much of the actual curvature of the neck you would see underneath what must have been massive neck muscles on these guys. Um, but it's still preferable to having, you know, no neck whatsoever on some of these. The shortness of the tail might surprise you relative to the length of the body, but that's ceratopsids for you. They just had these really short little tails. Um, which means that on Joanna's toy, we probably should shorten up the tail uh, and probably lengthen the body. The head is really just, it, the head is a third the length of the creature. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Whether the spine would bell curve or not really depends on what we're hypothesizing about how the hip was held. Uh, if the hip was held roughly parallel to the ground, you'd get this interesting sort of flat spot with the tail drooping right after that, whereas if it was held back a little bit, which you can barely tell with this toy, but you can still see it there. If it was held tilted back from, from parallel, you, you would get a rather smoother posture. 
Let's talk about fingers and toes. The Papo toy here is actually really, really good about this, even though they do have maybe a little too little flesh involved. The, the, the animal looks more lightly built than it would have been in life. But the classic look is to have more lizard-like feet. And we had an intermediary period where they had much more rhino-like or elephant-like feet. Now, as a ceratopsid, we are looking at something, it, it's basically a really stocky bird foot. It's got nails on it rather than really claws, but the toes are pretty short and, and it's supporting its weight on those toes and on the back feet on, on fleshy pads. Um, this is the major point that I have against Joanna's toy, which is that all of the toes are depicted with nails and they're all depicted at equal lengths. Um, what they would be is the first three on, of the fingers would be contacting the ground, and then the next two fingers uh, would not have a nail on them, because these are archosaurs, and they would be normally off the ground, if, if they were in use at all. Like, they seem to have been functional digits, uh, just not necessarily used for walking. The back feet, similarly, the, the Joanna toy has all four toes on the ground, which is not the case. The, the innermost toe would be held aloft because it was just this little, not quite dew claw, but, but heading in that direction. Uh, the other three toes were pretty much normal Ornithischian big foot, whatever that means for, for normal in a dinosaur. But there you go. Three toes contacting the ground, nails, fleshy pad. The front limbs on the Papo toy, as I mentioned, seem to lack flesh. They also seem to lack bone. The front limbs on ceratopsids in general were just beefy. They um, are the subject of a little bit of debate. This guy has them. For many years, they were depicted with a sprawled posture on their front limbs, or, or semi-sprawled. Uh, the current understanding is that they would indeed have their elbows bent when they're just standing in a, in a neutral posture, but the motion of their, their stride, the motion of their limb would normally be on what's called the parasagittal plane. It's, it's a plane parallel to the, the central dividing line of the animal. So it's not walking around with its, with its elbows out. It's, it's a much more really rhinoceros-like posture. We have a bit of variation on the skin textures that are presented in these various uh, toys. We've got everything from a sort of asphalt tubercle texture to uh, wrinkly elephantine looking stuff to random osteoderms, I guess? Or, or maybe these are just bigger tubercles rising out of the, the rest of the pavement. Um, we really need better resolution on the phylogeny of Styracosaurus because Centrosaurus has known skin impressions and they show a, a view that's pretty standard for a, for a ceratopsid where it's little tubercles with big ones encased within them. It's, it's uh, geometrically pretty consistent except for having those big ones in the mix. Um, sometimes we see Styracosaurus restored with um, quills like, like are supposed for Triceratops. Uh, I don't know how reasonable that is because uh, as far as I can tell, the big tubercles on the Centrosaurus sample don't have those nubs that, that are present on Triceratops, but it's, it's still a reasonable uh, fantasy to be putting in your paleo art. It's not directly contradicted by the fossil evidence. But look at Nesutoceratops' skin. That doesn't have this irregular pavement. That's like a tessellation. And we know that the pattern of scales or tubercles or scoots could be different on different parts of the animal. So what can we say with any confidence about Ceracosaurus? The ventral surfaces of the animal, the, uh, the belly and the throat and the bottom of the tail, would probably have rectangular tubercles or scoots. Um, 
much more geometric pattern, whereas the rest of the animal is probably most reasonably restored with the, the asphalt. Um, the elephantine wrinkly look, though, really needs to go away for dinosaur toys. But you didn't click on a ceratopsid video because you wanted to learn about the body. You want me to talk about the head. So, the distinctively ceratopsid beak, which is very parrot-like, tells us that they were breaking up hard food sources, like a parrot would. Um, this might mean woody angiosperms. This might mean roots and tubers. There were, there were a lot of renewable food sources in their environment uh, on the coastal plain that, that would require a little bit of work to get through. And to that end, these animals had massive jaw closing muscles. They start at what's called the coronoid process and go up through the temporal opening in the skull and attach to the back of the frill. What we can say with confidence about their feeding preferences is that they were probably low browsers because there's only a very limited range uh, upwards that they can move their heads unless they can rear. I cannot find any real research on whether ceratopsids could rear. If you know of any, comment, because I'd like to read it. Furthermore, we know that because the mouth of the animal was so narrow uh, compared to its contemporaries, uh, this was being a selective browser. This, this guy was being somewhat picky about what he would eat. It had to be. Um, this guy was living alongside Panoplosaurus and or Euoplocephalus, uh, Lambiosaurus, and Chasmosaurus. So that's a lot of giant herbivores all in the same environment. So you're going to have to have some kind of niche partitioning. And we think that it was niche partitioned by diet, by feeding strategy. The hadrosaurids would be the high browsers. They had the strong jaws and the large feeding heights of up to like four meters. Uh, and they had wider mouths than Styracosaurus did, which points to a more varied diet. Ankylosaurus, like Panoplosaurus, also had wide mouths, so not terribly selective either. They would be the low browsers, the grazers, um, and they would use their sharp head movements, uh, or maybe their long tongues to crop plants. Both of these groups have downward deflected mouths, whereas Ceratopsids uh, don't. They, they are able to move their neck to skull joint a lot more because the joint is more mobile. Chasmosaurus is a weirder co-occurrence because based on their diet, they should be extremely similar to Ceracosaurus. So there was probably some kind of ecological or social pressure that kept them separated, though not so extreme that we don't find them together. We do find Chasmosaurus in lower numbers than Ceracosaurus, or at least we find Chasmosaurines in lower numbers than we do uh, Centrosaurines. So maybe the Chasmosaurines' lower gregariousness is what allowed them to survive while the Centrosaurines die out in the late Cretaceous. Now, we only have two Styracosaurus bone beds compared to five for Centrosaurus, so we're not seeing high hundreds, low thousands uh, uh, as far as number of individuals in a herd, but still hundreds of animals. And we're reasonably certain that those bone beds do actually capture a group of animals that were together when they died in some kind of cataclysm, uh, uh, as opposed to, like, animals die over time and all accumulate in one place. So because they're living in big social groups, they have a bunch of social adaptations, the most flamboyant of which are the frills and horns and spikes. Um, but this also includes things like their noses, their quills maybe, their coloration, whatever vocalizations they would have been making. Uh, it's not just the stuff that we see on the bones directly. Speaking of the noses, um, a lot of these old ones have a, a, a just pathetic little nose on them. They're, it's it's like the beak just flows right into the little tiny spike, whereas the more modern representations have an appropriately large uh, nasal chamber. There's some speculation that ceratopsids would have had like sacs or, or something like uh, uh, in, inflatable structures to, to add to their display appearance, uh, or maybe they just used their nose, nasal chambers for some kind of fancy honking. But just in general, you, 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 you don't have this non-existent, like two little barely visible holes uh, in the front of the face. It's, 
it's a nose. The frill is another adaptation for display. The general trend between the Chasmosaurians and Centrosaurians is that Chasmosaurians got big giant frills, whereas Centrosaurians kept their frills small, but developed a huge repertoire of uh, uh, spikes to, to adorn them instead. So some of these you just find big frill and big spikes, which is not, not what you would be seeing. Um, there's a tendency to either show them as perfectly, well, relatively perfectly round frills, uh, uh, like Triceratops, or more squarish frills like uh, uh, a Chasmosaurus. Really, they should be a rough trapezoid or a really rough hexagon. And the arrangement of the spikes is very important. As I mentioned, it's not just a ring. And there's certainly no center line spike like on this one. The first parietal spike is actually absent in Rubeosaurus. Uh, that's this forward projecting one. The second spike is pointing inwards at the top near the center line. The next spike is the largest, uh, which in Styracosaurus is pointing outwards somewhat, whereas in Rubeosaurus they almost touch, or maybe they do touch uh, at the center. They're pointing inward. In Rubeosaurus, the fourth spike is almost as large as the third, whereas in Styracosaurus it's much smaller. Uh, and after that, in both cases, they dip lower and get smaller as you go into what are called the episquamosals instead of the epipariatals. Add to this the nose horn, the classic sort of rhinoceros giant looking thing, as far as I can tell, is uh, more of a Rubeosaurus look. So maybe Joanna's toy is actually supposed to be Styracosaurus ovatus and therefore Rubeosaurus. The nose spike on Styracosaurus proper, Albertensis, is a little bit of a puzzle. It's somewhat difficult to predict exactly how the keratin sheath is going to uh, grow out of a horn core. Like, you can reconstruct it, but sometimes we get surprises. Um, but it looks like it would be more like a Centrosaurus, where it's basically straight out, maybe slightly curved forward, not like a Rhinoceros or like a Rubeosaurus, where it's curved backwards. Then again, we see things like in Triceratops, where the brow horns can change direction as it ages, so maybe this is something that's individual variation or uh, variation over the course of an animal's lifetime. But we're certainly not going to have these little baby spikes that, that couldn't harm a fly. In addition to those more dramatic horns, we also have the little horns over the eyes, which were basically Centrosaurus-like. They were pyramidal, usually, uh, but in older animals, they would get resorbed and turn into these superorbital pits, which is kind of neat. So these all must be young animals because these are all showing uh, superorbital horns. Well, I guess some of these aren't. How about that? The sheer diversity of cranial ornamentation that we see in ceratopsids, the horns and spikes, uh, tells us that there must have been selection pressure there. Now, could that just be predator deterrence? Sure, but that doesn't really explain why there's so much variation between different genera, between different species. Um, I think it's the more mundane workaday functions that we should look at for why there's so much variation. These would be interspecific aggression, you know, trying to keep the Chasmosaurus off your turf. These would be intraspecific dominance displays, trying to uh, uh, keep your own personal space or, or keep your own mates or, or, or offspring or whatever safe. Um, these would be mutual sexual selection because we don't necessarily have uh, sexual dimorphism for Styracosaurus, so the, the females looked up pretty much the same as the males, so perhaps they were selecting one another based on how big and impressive their frill displays were. We would probably see ritualized combat 
for social ordering or territorial defense rather than actual combat. When you have an animal bristling with uh, horns and spikes, you don't actually have to make good on your threats because then you're going to have broken bones and a lot of head wounds, and that's just not going to help anybody. That's not for the good of the herd. That doesn't promote the stability of your species. We do have some bone pathologies on Styracosaurus that could be from combat with a, with a conspecific. Uh, we have parietal fractures, but those could have happened when the animal was young and its bones were weak, and it could have just been that it, that it hooked its, its newly formed frill spikes on a tree. Like when you were little, did you ever reach exactly that height where you started to hit your head on the rearview mirrors of cars? Like that, except it left a mark on its skull forever. We also have a pathology that is uh, some tail bones that were injured, but that could just as easily have been that the animal was laying down and a multi-ton conspecific wanders by and steps on it and breaks it. Which would probably have resulted in some conspecific combat, but uh, not, uh, not the kind that we're worried about with social ordering. <laughs> Instead, what we would probably see, and I'm going to use these two for, for demonstrative purposes, we would probably see uncompleted charges where the animal just starts to charge and the other one either backs off or stands its ground, so it's, it's either calling its bluff or not. We would see vocalizations, which I'm not going to pretend to do. <laughs> we might see them tilting their frill vertically, where it, in the normal posture it's actually somewhat parallel to the, to the back there, although both of these animals have their frill spikes curved backwards quite a bit more than they would be in life. Uh, but tilting it forward would create an interesting threat display, make the animal look bigger and scarier. What combat we do predict for Centrosaurians and Styracosaurus specifically is very different from what we're predicting for uh, Chasmosaurians. Not only do these animals not have brow horns, they, they don't have the broad frills or the barrel-shaped bodies that the Chasmosaurians did, so they probably wouldn't be locking horns. What they would be doing is either the animals face each other parallel and sort of try to get under the animal's flank or rake them with their parietal spikes or maybe bite at the tail or, or hind limb, or we see one animal basically t-boning the other one, uh, which would pretty much result in the same sorts of pathologies, you know, injuries to the flank, injuries to the base of the tail. All of which is to say we have a pretty complex behavioral repertoire for animals that do not have very large brains. <laughs> And that it was forming these large social aggregations is consistent with what we know about the Dinosaur Provincial Park uh, and to medicine formation at this time. 75 million years ago, the uh, Cretaceous in Western Interior Seaway uh, on the east and the forming Rocky Mountains on the west bordered this narrow fluctuating band of alluvial plains, that is uh, uh, coastal plains that are cut apart by rivers. Um, and in that environment where there was a seasonally wet climate, dinosaurs thrived because there was abundant food. We talked uh, a couple of times now about endemism, the idea that uh, in one continent you'll have one group of animals and in another continent you'll have another. I'm pointing specifically at these animals and at Carnotaurus because they lived at approximately the same time, even though they never would have met each other. That's endemism. But we also have endemism uh, within a continent. Uh, within Laramidia, we see uh, uh, very small geographic areas in which you have different animals. Um, two Medicine Formation is not that far from Dinosaur Provincial Park. One is in Alberta and one is on the Alberta-Montana border. So having a different genus that close tells us that one, the animals would likely not be doing that transcontinental mass migration that people like to imagine huge herds of dinosaurs taking part in, uh, at, at least not Styracosaurus. We, we don't have evidence for this. Um, and two, these are mesothermic animals who have no reason to migrate because food is readily available. There might be like minor migrations, maybe they go inland to uh, uh, 
nest. Maybe they go inland during the wet season because it's just easier to find food there at that time. But that's really minor east-west migrations, uh, nothing that would indicate that they were mixing with other populations uh, north or south. So are there differences in the environment in which Tyrachosaurus lives relative to Rubiosaurus' environment? Yes. One is much more mesic than the other. Uh, uh, we use the terms mesic and xeric. Basically, a mesic environment would be something like a hardwood forest or a prairie, whereas a xeric environment would be more like a inland scrubland. The main difference being that Styracosaurus lived somewhere where it was seasonally wet, whereas Rubiosaurus it was seasonally arid. Styracosaurus was a uh, more estuarine coastline, that is, where rivers meet the sea, whereas uh, Rubiosaurus was further inland. Now, over the years, or over the eons, uh, from 75 million years ago to 70-ish million years ago, the interior seaway was advancing. It was uh, moving the eastern coastline of Laramidia inland, and eventually it inundated uh, the areas where the descendants of Styracosaurus and Rubiosaurus would have been living. And uh, uh, once it receded again, the Centrosaurians were gone. It was the Chasmosaurians continent now. So we think that the more mesic environment where Styracosaurus lived might have been similar to the ancestral uh, uh, environment for Styracosaurus and Rubiosaurus's common ancestor, and that common ancestor moved into the two medicine formation back when it was more mesic, and then as it became xeric, they adapted and, and, and uh, uh, evolved into Rubiosaurus. And it's important to note that these species didn't actually last that long in a geologic sense. Um, Styracosaurus was only around for about half a million years. Uh, that's nothing geologically. Um, we, at any one point in Laramidia, we actually have rather low diversity. Uh, we have high endemism, but we also have high turnover. So the only way that we get this impressive diversity of ceratopsids is by drilling down vertically through time. This would imply that there must be many, many species awaiting discovery. So get out there. So that's Styracosaurus. For as long as we've known about it, our, our understanding of its anatomy has been changing and being revised, but when we consider it in its environmental context, we can start to get an accurate picture of what this dinosaur was and, and, and how it lived. So I want to thank you all for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Uh, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can get involved with our nonprofit organization here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we will see you next time, which will hopefully be a much shorter interval than the last time I said that. You saw Styracosaurus here, now own it by visiting the Geek Group store and claiming your very own dino merchandise featuring what we've covered so far. With every item you buy, you're supporting our channel so we can bring you more of the content you love. Click the link below to check it out and thank you for your support.